Watch the series finale of X-Men next Saturday morning. Check your local listings. Hello. You want the goodies? Welcome to the goodie room. And the Disney stock just keeps going down and down and down. <laughs> and then Bob Iger is all like, eh, nah, this don't have me back. <laughs> Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> They're going to do the Mary Poppins thing. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. Well, hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to my channel. I'm Lorena, Lorena Creole, of course, bringing you that spice to sci-fi and pop culture analysis. And you know I'm always keeping it real when it comes to theme parks. And speaking of keeping it real, welcome, welcome here to the Spice Lounge show where I have my friends on and we do some hot takes, spicy commentary, and just have a ball doing that and getting you guys' comments there in the chat. So we got a loaded show for you today. Um, we've got Ernie Hudson saying, you know what? Uh, it's not always racism when it comes to uh, pay for Black actors in, in Hollywood. And uh, dude's got some uh, cred to back that up. We've also got the thing blowing up now where Black Girl Gamers, who appears to be, I'm not gonna say appears to be, because according to the website they are, doing the same type of thing that Sweet Baby Inc. has been doing with respects to narrative consultation. And they're, uh, threat to sue that park place, which your girl walks for that park place. So we're going to talk about that. And of course, we are going to talk about the man, Nelson Peltz, basically calling out Marvel and Disney for wokeness in their movies. Although the interesting thing is the Hollywood press seems to have framed it in a way to say, how dare this, uh, white man say these types of things, but your girl and my panelists, we're going to break that down because uh, what Hollywood displayed is not quite exactly what's uh, what's going on. And Disney has decided to uh, maybe rehire a famous OG Imagineer. Who is that? Well, we're going to let you know later on in the show. So I see 15 of you guys in here so far. I appreciate the heck out of this. We have got back again from her well-rested vacation, Retro Nerd Girl. Hi, Wait. guys. Hi. <laughs> She's got even more gorgeous nails than me. Well, it's her It's her fault. She got me addicted to doing this now. So. <laughs> oh, I'm so sweet. Oh, man. <laughs> I am glad to have you back here. Uh -huh. And I'm also glad to have Lou Wasserman's ghost with us as well. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine. My nails are bitten to the quick because I'm excited to be here. So I will put them on display. <laughs> Well, we are uh, excited to have uh, to have you here, especially when we're talking about what what I call uh, the Hollywood crazy oh, <laughs> yeah. out there. <laughs> We've always, for the record, had crazies. Yep. It, just haven't had the kind like this button to say, "Hold my beer." Uh, they take crazy mm -hmm. to a level of, uh, well, you know, <laughs> you know, you see it every day. I tell you, I, I always say that, you know, Hollywood was more productive Ooh. when it ran on uh, alcohol, co well, basically cocaine and hookers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
I would give her her death story. And, and, and Lou will probably know about this. Is this probably true? Uh, Jerry Bruckheimer. I forget which movie of his made like a crap ton of money and he basically faxed all the other studio heads rubbed it in their face about how much his uh his movie made but yeah yeah uh well yeah there, there is a lot of dancing powder in that town that's for sure oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Cactoid Pinata. Hello. Says they certainly oh. made better movies with cocaine. Yeah. Uh, they thought so. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the problem with that, Cactoid, seriously, is there's so much that it's how do we know they wouldn't have been better without? There's nothing to compare with. Mm. Well, it's at least it looked thing. like they had fun with it. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Con air. How are you going to come up with the idea of let's have some convicts in a plane? Except for all we know, somebody said, how about a plane crashes into the Vegas Strip? And then they work backwards. <laughs> because seriously, you know, Hitchcock for North by Northwest, the original idea he wrote down was the man in Lincoln's nose. He knew he wanted to end with that run across Mount Rushmore. And then he called in the screenwriter and said, make that the finale and figure out what I want to do the rest of the movie. So, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I did not know yeah, that. I didn't yeah, either. It was literally, the man in Lincoln's nose. <laughs> wow. So, uh, and then <laughs> Mount Rushmore wouldn't let him do it there, and they had to go build it on a set. So, uh, mm, yeah. Oh, well, Sounds about right. Know. Compared to the films, you know, of, of today, it's like, man, huh. They seem and, to be and much more about Harry, half foot. Harry Grant told Hitchcock he didn't understand what was going on in the whole film. And he said, good, that'll make you realistic as the confused guy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, <laughs> but that was Hitch. Hitch was special. Did uh, I ever tell you my six degree separation with Hitchcock? When I started on a, a series that you all know and hopefully loved uh, at Universal was right after Hitchcock had passed away and mm -hmm. they gave me his parking place. And, and I pull into the place and here's still the little marker that says Alfred Hitchcock. Well, I own it. Uh, wow. <laughs> I took it away before they came with mine to replace it. So, you know, six degrees of parking with Hitchcock or something like that. that is wow, so that is cool. really cool. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Just Hitch, it's it's amazing. I, I love Hitchcock is a master. Mm -hmm, His films, I'll still I'll still watch them, and just what he did with all his film tricks and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and of course the other thing he did was he very very extensively storyboarded, and he only shot what he needed. In other words, most people you shoot a master and a couple of over the shoulders and a couple of close ups and you cut it together later. If that line wasn't going to be in the master, he didn't shoot it in the master. He, if that line was only going to be a close-up, so that the studios couldn't recut what he did. They were stuck with oh, what wow. he gave them. Yeah. Wow. Yep, that way he was famous for that. He said actually shooting the movie was boring. It was the planning he enjoyed. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a little bit of both, actually, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I always make that joke for the time that I spent in a uh, Hollywood. I was never the same when I left. So I always bring that up. Yeah. But, you were you were a brief traveler through that magic universe known as my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was born there. My mama was born there. My father moved there when he was three years old, you know, so it, <sighs> man, it was it was crazy. Literally, I'd have to call my parents and say, okay, before you see this on the news or you see it on the tabloid rags in the supermarket, this is what really happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Literally, yeah. that was that was the that was the conversation so bad. Man, when I left LA, I could not look at a supermarket tabloid. I couldn't <laughs> look at any like inside dish. I couldn't look at any of that because I'm just like, I lived that for I don't know how freaking long. I'm like, I, I, I it's like, I, I, uh, I can't. Hey, there he is. Hey, culture. hey, hey. sorry, I was running late. I, I had to get something to drink and, and oh. I had to answer the phone. So I apologize. No but I'm, here. I'm here. I'm glad to be here. And I get to see that uh, retro nerd girl and Lou are here. Oh. So here I am. Yes. 
<laughs> hail, hail, the gang's all here. Yeah. We're just talking about Hollywood and cocaine and other irrelevancies. So, yeah. you know, you didn't miss much. Oh, well, no, I, those were the days, right? We had good movies back then. <laughs> Literally just what we said. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, and, and we at least adjusted it like at least they were entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I mean, anyway. you know, you've got some great stuff. you got Lethal Weapon and you got, you know, Die Hard. And, you know, a lot of those directors may have been influenced by Colombian marching powder. You don't no. know. <laughs> Thank God for the production managers. They didn't spend, we were talking about shooting it 17 times, you know, to get something mediocre. True. True. <laughs> well, hey, all you guys, 21 of you folks in here watching. So glad that you're here. Welcome to the Spice Lounge. We are about to get into the spice. So are we ready? Yes. yes. We are ready. Okay. Well, Mark, we of got... course I've seen Rio Bravo. <laughs> 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 oh, you were talking about uh, DL with his John Wayne moniker there. Yeah, right. Uh, we have got two hot topics to kind of go over before we get to ooh. the whole Nelson Peltz asking the questions that those of us have been asking for quite a long time. So... Coming to us from The Hollywood Reporter, Ghostbusters star Ernie Hudson talks inequitable treatment, pay disparity. It's not quite that simple to blame racism. Yep. Yeah. After, I, I cheated and read this already. Did That's you? not I did cheating. Too. <laughs> I did too. We all read <laughs> We did our so homework. You don't have to. It's supposed to be your next line, culture. Uh, it's theme true. Song. Yeah, that is my theme. But uh, but what 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 bothers me about this is just how out of context this headline is. So I know yeah, we'll get yeah. to that in a moment. But. It is a Hollywood yeah. reporter, man. And, and I have to tell you, I absolutely love Ernie Hudson, and he speaks facts and truth ninety nine percent of the time. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I was actually concerned because um, I I heard. Um, a few days ago that he had mentioned something about his treatment. And I was like, oh, no, here we go again. And and I was like really pleasantly surprised to hear what he actually said. Yeah. Uh, his, his part of the quote, not the rest of the article, but his quote, um, which really sounds and feels a lot like sort of the and the Daisy Ridley setup that we saw a few weeks back where, uh, you know, somebody was like, hey, uh, did you feel this way or did, did this happen for you? And, you know, she's like, what? It, it, it's, you know, what are you talking about? You know, this is more like it, like they were trying to get at like, oh, were you discriminated against because you were uh, a black man? And he really said it straight, like, hey, and there's a number of reasons why he wasn't top billed or pay, got, didn't get paid as much or wasn't actually considered like ghost, the Ghostbuster in the beginning. They clearly had his character be that character. And I did a full analysis of that movie. And it's actually his part is actually very, very good. And I think everybody yeah. enjoyed his character. And so... I was actually pleased to see him continue be um, be a part of this whole thing, and I, I love I love all of his quote, like how he was able to just describe that this this is not what you think it is. <laughs> it's not what you think it is. It's, and of it's course, not as soon just as he that. said that, the story went away in the general media because he's not telling the story they want to tell. Yeah, but, but you know, we 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 lose sight of the fact that yeah, you got to have your leads and your leading ladies and. But you got to have the rest of the rest of the gang. You know, when you think about all those great people granted on contract, uh, you know, this guy is to our age what the Sydney Green Streets, Peter Lorre's, uh, uh, all of those people that were supporting players who showed up again and again and again were, which is the stock company of the repertoire theater of Hollywood. Yeah. And and they're damn good at it, you know, and uh, uh a lot of them weren't paid a lot of money. They were paid like a couple of thousand dollars for showing up or, or I mean, to, for being there. Sure. They sure. weren't being paid top 
you know, top uh, billing uh, with with the mega stars. And and you have, uh, you know, as far as budgeting goes, you have to as- figure out like, okay, well, we can afford this actor for this amount. It's, there's also the option of any actor to refuse the the payment that that yeah, exactly. off. So they, you don't have to take a, a, a low ball price. And that's the other thing that I think when we hear these like, oh, I'm not being paid as much as other actors. Talk to your agent and see if they can actually negotiate a higher there price you for you. I, I, I was, I, I, oh, ahead, for, for a certain amount of my time, I was also a representative for the Dramatist Guild and a very famous playwright was talking about when they made a TV show out of one of his plays. And he said, I was all excited and they paid me a lot of money. And then I went out to Hollywood from New York and I found that there was a whole staff of writers, none of whom I knew, none of whom I'd approved of, and all of whom were getting more money than I was. And I was really, that's Hollywood, to heck with it. And my reaction was, you have a bad agent. Uh, yes. You know, get, negotiate a better deal. It's not their fault for taking the gig if they could get it. Uh, but, you know, but some people just like being victims. That's just the way it is. And and that's and that's pretty much um, what uh, what it is. Even for the brief amount of time that I spend in that crazy bubble known as Hollywood, I knew agents. I knew actors who had fired agents because they're just like, he's not getting me work, she's not getting me work, or whatever. So when I hear certain black actresses or black actors in general, or we'll just put it that way, any actor. When you start whining about pay disparity, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you negotiate. And people tend to forget who that is. It's like, it's your fault if you do not have someone like Ari Gold (laughs) negotiating. Or someone who has a clients and they make a deal to get you because they're going to get more for the guy that's working more or is bigger. Uh, There is a famous joke in Hollywood that probably none of you have heard, so I'll tell you. Uh, This actor comes home from work one day, and as he's driving up the street, he sees his house is on fire. And he drives up, and the front door is hanging on one hinge, and there's graffiti everywhere. And he runs into the house, and everything's been trashed and burned, and he thinks, not my wife. And he runs in the bedroom, and she's bound and gagged, and she's been beaten. And he's taking the wrappings off of her, and he says, who did this? Who did this? I'll kill him, I tell you. Who did this? And she says, it was your agent. He suddenly smiles and says, "My agent came to the house." So <laughs> yes, I so get that. Oh my gosh! Oh man! So you these... know that's. Uh, uh, I'm glad. But, but then, of course, there's the one about the director, the assistant about, uh, director, and the producer. Yeah, we're walking on a beach and they find a bottle. And they uncork the bottle, and a genie comes out. He says, "You know, normally I give three wishes, but since there's three of you, you can each have a wish." So he points at the assistant director and says, what do you want? And he says, well, I want to be doing a picture with half a dozen beautiful bikini-clad extras on a beach somewhere. And boom, he's gone. And the director says, well, I want to be doing a classic tale and have uh, Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep and Sir Lawrence Olivier in Paris. And boom, he disappears. He turns to the producer and says, what do you want? He says, I want those two guys back here right now. So <laughs> nice. those are, the, those are the, the, the true jokes of Hollywood, so to speak. But anyway. That is, uh, uh, yeah, I'm having flashbacks. <laughs> uh-huh. I'll have to tell you guys eventually one day my adventures of or misadventures of dating actors in Hollywood and their agents. I That's never did that. Interesting. Uh-huh. Oh, you're so fortunate. They just freaking find me. It's it's crazy. It's like, oh, I was in such and such and so and so. I'm like, okay, well, if I can't see it in the movies or I can't rent it at Blockbuster, it does not count. <laughs> just saying anyway anyway one of the big things in this um in this article that ernie hudson revealed is that do you know the part of winston zeddemore was originally going to be played by eddie murphy yeah that i know and had it been it would have been a bigger part yeah you know because hey it's eddie murphy so you know yeah didn't he just come up? Wasn't this? Was this before? I think it was after Forty Eight Hours that uh, 
the Ghostbusters movie started filming, I believe. I'm not sure, but I do know that at that point in time, as much money and exposure, Eddie Murphy was like the it guy in oh, Hollywood. Yeah. So definitely it would make more sense that if he got paid more, but he passed on it for whatever reason. And the part yeah. that was 1982, 48 hours. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then Trading Places in 83 mm -hmm. and Beverly Hills Cop in 84 when oh, this was done. So I think uh, Eddie's agent picked the right thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But of, course, but of course, Eddie Murphy had all that exposure from Saturday Night Live. So, you yeah. know. Well, and, and look, he, the reason he, he'd even been considered for it was because he'd just worked with Aykroyd in Trading Places. Right. So, That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But uh, look, sure the role could have been bigger obviously if you had eddie murphy but i'm going to tell you right now um winston's my one of my favorite characters uh it's vankman and winston you know and i know everybody else is going to say that's weird but no i just i thought he was a cool customer especially when you know he came in and he 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 was he was really the like kind of the workhorse that kept the ghostbusters going and then in into the second film it was awesome and then by the time we get around to the new films he's the linchpin in making sure yeah. the ghostbusters work you know mm -hmm. and you know it, you, you not only do you get paid what you negotiate which is the, the truest statement ever but you 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 also get it uh you know pursuant to what you're actually doing and i i i guarantee you that in this film he got paid the the latest film he got paid well so then again yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry anyway yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, going back to that first movie, um, he's actually through a conversation with him um, and um, Dan Aykroyd's char character, they actually come up with the, the fact that this is a world ending kind of event that's going on. So he, he actually participates in the storyline mm -hmm. um, and, and advancing it. So I, I, I think. Um, you know, yes, he's he's a very important character, but also um, he isn't the main character. I don't think, and I think he he rationalizes that all out in the articles quotes that they they have for him uh, beautifully, and also you know gives some credit where credit is due. And and I I was really surprised by the statements he said about Bill Murray. So. I mean, he's. Yeah, I'm. I'm really happy that that I um, I read that article. Yeah, because here it is, right here. Uh, Hudson said Murray was a huge supporter of Hudson, fighting for a bigger role for his co-star during the negotiations for Ghostbusters Two. He said wouldn't do another one unless I was involved. That doesn't happen wow. very much in this industry. Hudson said. I just thought that was just yeah. an amazing um, quote and a, and a dose of, of realism with all the people who you hear um, online or in the ether or in the peanut gallery, so to speak, talking about discrimination, this and racism, that, and this wouldn't happen now. We need representation. Okay. This was organic representation that was happening. And you had people who recognized talent and it's very obvious Bill Murray's like, look, this guy, he was awesome in the first film. So yeah, we want him back. Yeah, we want to work back with him and went to bat for him. And it's interesting how it's, I didn't hear about it, but it's interesting that, you know, um, Ernie Hudson kind of kept this part to himself until he was interviewed about it. Yeah, oh, and I, okay. I never saw him at a convention. <laughs> yeah, I I think also too. It, is it like s such a big deal? Well, now it is because of all of the stuff in the news. Like, there's a lot of people who just don't like Bill Murray because he can be a little bit off putting uh, mm -hmm. to people. Um, Drew Barrymore kind of outed him and on one of her shows. So I mean. A person can be um, cold and uh, maybe inappropriate, but also can be a nice individual too. And that's another thing I notice with our society today. It's just very much 
like either you're a bad person and you are you're a dog and we never want to see you again there's no in between like hey some maybe you get them on a bad day or a good day doesn't make you a bad person didn't kill anybody and you know what i mean and he did something very nice for somebody um so <laughs> yes it's not like it's like saying maybe a schmuck but he's no alec baldwin but anyway <laughs> oh. <laughs> kill anybody. Uh, <laughs> it's like anyway but look, <laughs> you buy these people warts and all you buy their eccentricities you buy what they bring to the table and sometimes you know uh that's that's strange and quirky stuff now if it gets to the point of real abusiveness or whatever yes. uh there's this other story in this same paper about rebel wilson talking about um uh, Borat, and that's another story altogether, you know. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I don't know if you saw that one. If you didn't, let's not even go there. Uh, I, I saw it, and it kind of like went over my head. I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. But to kind of wrap the story up, um, yes. I love this quote that Hudson said, and uh, I'm gonna actually say it all and say it all here together. We can say it's a racial thing, but I think if Eddie Murphy had played the role I played, he would have been paid very well. Hudson said. I think studios are in the business of making money and they pay what they feel they have to. Yeah. You know, it's like when everybody got all upset about, oh, gee, that gun with the wind with those terrible stereotypes. And supposedly, uh, I think it was either Hattie McDaniel or Butterfly McQueen said, you know what? Uh, if I'd been a real maid instead of playing one, I wouldn't have made anywhere near as much money and taken care of my kids as well. So what's your problem, you know? Uh, all of these people who want to wipe out, well, Song of the South, everything else. They yes. want to make all of these people's entire careers and the kids they fed and the kids they may have put through college and the houses they bought and the stores they shopped at. They want all that to vaporize because of some totally outmoded concept that never existed then. Uh, you know, nobody was getting chained and whipped and beaten. And, and you know, now they're into that, too. But that's another story. Uh, but, but all I'm saying is. This business of applying standards in the abstract, because it's it, at that point, it's not about standards. It's about you think you're better than everybody else and you want to break. That's my two cents. You know, I you're right. But it's just, look, you can't go and apply today's standards to older materials. All of the materials that have been ever created mm -hmm. are not going to have the same weight, same effect, uh, the, the same relevance to the culture that we live in now. Yeah. That's just the way history works. You're just, and and, and there have even been times when those two, when two worldviews, look at the relationship, just out of the blue, of Winston Churchill and FDR. Churchill wanted the war over so he could get on with being the British Empire. FDR said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do all that colonial stuff anymore. And they were very much opposed to each other on that. But they realized the bigger problem and solved it, you know. So there have always been times in history when, when ideas conflict. And hopefully we come up with a better answer, but that doesn't well, invalidate everything that came before that doesn't match it. Sure. And and again, I mean, and, and the nice thing about having older material is it gives us context for now. And it also informs people as to what actually happened, because we're watching history being stripped away and rewritten. Well, that is inaccurate. Whereas in film and cinema, at least it'll give you a sense culturally of what was going on. That's what film, film or any form of art is about translating the existing culture in a way that can be consumed by the masses, whether it's a, you know, a painting, a drawing, a, mm -hmm. a, a song, an opera, whatnot, right? It's, that's what these mediums are for. Um, when you go to film school or, you know, just take a, a, a film history class or whatever, it, which I recommend everybody do if you're of, of age, young, young enough person to enjoy it, mm -hmm. go and check that out. Just go. The history of film is is fascinating. And if you get a top tier instructor, they're going to start back in, in, in at the very beginning, you know, where you're looking at um, uh, the cinema. The silent air. Yeah, yeah, and then you'll and then you'll start with the silent era and move forward. But I mean, you know, moving pictures. This idea goes way back into like the French history when you know they had a candlelight that was passing through glass panes. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it, it, there's there's all of this stuff that 
that's out there for us to 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 learn about. And when you learn about it, you're also learning about how to structure a story. Because if if you go back and watch a silent film, and I know Lorraine has done this, and I know that uh, Lou's done it, and I don't know about you, retro you know, I, girl, but I, uh, good. So <laughs> when you watch a silent film, there's no words. There yeah. occasionally you'll get a title card, and then you know with roughly what the dialogue is. But the, mm -hmm. you are being told a story in moving pictures that you can easily follow because that's what is being translated to you. And you, you look the idea that we need dialogue all the time. No, dialogue now is abused as more expository than than it needs to be. Some of the best moments in film is usually silence. And if you watched the most recent example of that, Godzilla minus one, yeah, where you, where you had the interspersement of 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 a black and white in color at a certain mm -hmm. point in the film, when you also had um, the absence of sound, the complete absence of sound at the most emotional pinnacle. So, um, like I said, if you ever get a chance to go through a, a, a film class, this is the reason to do it because it it'll bring even more understanding to what you know uh, Ernie Hudson's talking about here and everything else. It's like you know everything's a part of the story, and culturally, sometimes you have a bigger role, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you you show up and you win an Oscar for not being um, Oppenheimer. Sometimes that huh. happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and as I, I just put in our private chat, but I hope we can put it in the regular one. If you can't find a class and you're looking mm -hmm. for kind of the Bible of the basic history of the movie industry, uh, you want to read a book by my old professor, uh, The Liveliest Art by Arthur Knight. And it's the basic story of how this whole crazy business happened and very well worth your time. That there is, you go. Yeah, that is and, cool. And those of you who are a little older might remember Arthur. Uh, he used to write that continuing series called The History of Sex in the Cinema in Playboy, uh, which was kind of fun. Wow. But uh, he was he was great. We He had a class at USC Cinema a million years ago that they used to joke. I forget what the real name of the class was, but we called it Thursday Night at the Movies with Arthur. And he would bring in a new movie and the director and the producer and the stars. And we'd watch it and talk to them and ask questions. And those were some of the most exciting sessions when you were a young hiring filmmaker um wow. you know and and you had people for example i don't know if you've ever seen a boy and his dog uh don johnson's first major role which is this alternate universe in the future where soldiers each have a dog that they talk to psychically who helps them sniff out the enemy Ooh. and jason robards did the voice of the dog uh in his head and harlan ellison wrote the book and uh, uh lq jones wow. who you might remember as a, as a bad guy actor with high cheekbones he directed it, and Alvy Moore, who was one of the old uh, Griffith, Andy Griffith Show guys, who produced it. Anyway, somebody in the audience, you know, film students being young punks, gets up and says, Mr. Ellison, uh, in the book, you never told what breed the dog was. How did you pick that dog for the film? And the answer was, well, like everything else in Hollywood, he screwed the producer, you know. So it was, it was fun and irreverent and... Uh, we, uh, I could talk about I, that all day. I, but anyway, I won't, I promise. I was going to say, I wholeheartedly agree. One of the best electives that I took in college because I needed something that was going to be interesting. And as an engineering student, I had to get stuck taking something for arts credit. So I took a film class and totally got me hooked on how much uh, I love film and, you know, in the writing process. And you're very, you're very right. Having those films preserves time in a bottle so to speak and it's reflective of those times and i really think that people need to remember that and we need to stop censoring those things because you think someone might not think the way that uh, the way that you do but speaking of people not thinking the way that you do <laughs> i gotta gotta jump in gotta jump into this one first oh, of all God. thank you for the 32 of you folks here watching the spice us yes. make sure you hit that that subscribe button and let people know share the stream out let them know that we are here talking these hot topics so uh Ooh. gamergate 2 has gone from a little 
uh, spark to a floating garbage fire. <laughs> that little spark of inspiration is at the heart of yes. all creation, even yes. stupid creation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this lady is not a dream finder. No. Let's put it that way. No. And I wish she was only a figment. Uh, <laughs> I look at her and first of all, this article from John Trent over at uh, that park place is a reason why this is going to be uh, relevant uh, in a bit. Children's BBC host Jules Hardy calls for final purge of gamers after boycott list created for consultants, black girl gamers. Uh, so when you hear final purge, that does not sound to me like a shopping trip. It doesn't sound to me like a pleasure cruise. It sounds to me like something that uh, reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution in China. Oh no, it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the right now, I, I, I mean, you know, it. it, it this, the, she's not going to be on the winning side of things because <laughs> there's right now. I mean, we're, we're she's 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 actually only inspiring more people to come out and fight against this this cultural garbage. I've been incredibly frustrated. This this article is incredibly well written. That park place is getting a lot of gas right now. Uh, they're mm -hmm. being attacked left and right because they're effective. We're effective. You're effective, Lorena. Keep going. You know, and it, you know, it's like you were on fire today on Twitter. By the way, if you guys don't follow Lorena on Twitter, she's fun. Uh, but um, <laughs> it's a fun follow. <laughs> but um, but it, it, in all honesty, I mean, it, 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 calling out this type of monotheistic approach to everything is kind of a requirement for being a, a human being because you, there are room for all kinds of ideas there are room there's room for ideologies but there are some ideologies that are incredibly destructive and when you go and seek to eliminate or exclude the people who actually created the gaming culture in the first place you mm -hmm. are garbage and that's what this woman's talking about mm. yeah yeah. And when you look her up and you go to her webpage all about herself and how wonderful she is, mm -hmm. um, she talks about performing her TED Talk in Canada. I didn't know you performed TED Talk. I didn't think so. Um, and, and I don't know what the average age of a gamer is out there, but let's just say she's passed her sell by date. And you can't, you can find some professor named Jules Hardy. But you can't find her birthday anywhere on the internet. And the picture she chose to put up of herself on her website mm -hmm. doesn't look exactly like a happy, youthful game kind of person. Let's just put it that way. No, she she looks like how how would how would I call this? Um the chicks who were in it for the exposure yeah. and the connections, not the one who's in it because, you know, because you're a true gamer. I like getting glammed up as much as the next person. But if I'm going to roll up and start playing, like, say, Doom Eternal or Hogwarts Legacy or, you know, uh, Fallout or whatever, I have on my comfy clothes. I have on my headphones. I, you know, if I was on a show like this, I'd probably have, I don't know, some kind of geeky shirt. Probably like a PlayStation throwback shirt or something like that. But you could not dispute the fact that I know what I'm talking about when it comes to gaming and the gaming yeah. culture. This chick, okay. Her claim, her claim to fame is she's got an exercise program where the moves are based on the moves of characters in video games. Uh, so what? She's the Sonic the Hedgehog jog or the... Uh, I don't know the uh, Super Mario Shuffle, or I have no idea. But I don't know. Maybe she just put that's a Candy scary crush thought, on a on her phone. But I mean, Ugh. the whole thing with this, and this is and this is something that some people are not going to say, but I will say it. You have people like Julia, your quote unquote white savior complex. Okay. Uh huh. They feel that they have to be champions for a group of people that did not ask them to be or for a subgroup of people to which she gets credit for talking that about this. Okay. It's racist. Yes. 
that is condescending racism. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's the people who say, well, you shouldn't have to show an ID to vote because black people can't get one. And then they interview people on the street. You got an ID? Yeah, of course. What do you mean? Well, there's no problem. I went to no. the DMV and I got one. What's the big deal? She she is like, I would say, if you've ever seen the movie The Color Purple, the original one, Spielberg yeah. stuck his neck out to get done. Okay. Yes. And Miss Sophia finally gets to go and see her children. Okay. And I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting the I'm forgetting the name of the uh the white character who didn't feel comfortable being there. You know, they were they were trying to help her with her car because she couldn't drive work a damn. And she was like, oh, they're attacking me. And I've always been good to you people. This is the attitude that we're talking about right here with this person. So basically, how dare you call these people to the carpet for the crap that they're involved in? How dare you hold them to that type of standard? You know? How dare you? You're racist if you, you know, if you do that. And the fact that she's talking about calling for a quote unquote final purge, it's just like, okay, so you do not like the fact that there are a group of people, gamers out here, who aren't sitting back for this crap and who are correctly calling it out. But you think saying stuff like this is going to help you? It, it doesn't, it doesn't help you. Well, it, there's something we talked about earlier today, if you had a chance to catch it on Midnight's Edge in the morning, but it, it, we've talked about it here before, too. Lorraine and I have talked about this extensively last time we had some kerfuffle, and it's something called the the Streisand effect, and the, all she's doing is feeding that. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's, I think you actually, you may have even tweeted about it again today, Lorena, you know, and, and it's just like... You, by bringing more attention to this, it's going to bring the wrong kind of attention to this in, in their eyes. In her eyes, she's she's uh, she's causing a worse problem for her side of the equation by saying something this inflammatory, by having the uh, approach that she does. You know, and, and, and I'm going to say something, and I'm going to say this, and it's going to be racial, and I don't normally do that. But white liberal women are a problem. Thank you. That's it. All right, let me stop. They are a huge, huge, huge problem. And if you think I don't agree with culture, uh, go on to uh, Midnight's Edge and go look up an episode of Toxic Femininity where oh, I basically yeah. called Frost out on her nonsense. Okay. <laughs> it's the same, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. They want to be perceived as an ally. See, I'm an ally, but are you really? You see, you want to be an ally for certain types of people. Let's get into this article from that park place, which has the Black Girl Gamers website all, all in their feelings, okay, threatening to take legal action against my colleagues at that park place. And since they said that park place, and that encompasses all of us, which means you're trying to come after me too. Let's get that straight. So, and, uh, can I just point out? Oh, go well, ahead. We, what they said was, and I don't have it in front of me, but they said we are seeking representation to take legal action. What that means is, whoever their regular lawyer is said, uh -uh, "I ain't touching that. Go get yourself <laughs> an ambulance chaser." So right away they had to go find somebody, and so far they haven't. If you're going to sue somebody, what you do is you write them a nasty letter from your lawyer, and if they don't answer in 24 hours or whatever, you sue them. Uh, when I saw this, I put up on our private back chat the famous scene from The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, where Tuco, Eli Wallach, is in this bathtub, and this guy comes in, and I've been tracking you for eight months, and waiting for a time when I could kill you, and blah, 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 blah. And Tuco's got his gun under the water, and he just blang, 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 kills him, and he says, if you're going to shoot, shoot. Don't talk about it. These people are all talk and no, no action, and they have no grounds, and it's silly, you know. No, uh, no. And, and as I was mentioning, uh, John Trent has a newer video up after this article that a girl who used to work for Black Girl Gamers yes. uh, now comes forward and says, uh, these people kicked me out because I wouldn't hate white people. Gothics TV. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Yes. 
I I I, I love it, graphics. It's it's been love... back in the way back machine, but I totally remember this. And this is the crux of what I'm trying to explain to people. Okay. A group like Black Girl Gamers, they aren't truly for representation. They want the representation that they want. They want the representation of Black people who want to bring everything on white people. Okay. They do not want the people who are like, you know, okay, representation. Yeah, all right. You know, hey, we might put some other, uh, other characters of different ethnicities in the game. But it's still going to be a kick-ass game. You know what I mean? <laughs> but apparently... As if that mattered. Yeah, it, it's it's like well, it's kind of like it's it's. This is what I tell people: representation is something, but it is not everything. That's the difference. So it's if you're like, okay, you know what? Eh, maybe our player count is a little vanilla. Maybe we're gonna put some other ethnicities in there just to give people variety like one of my favorite games like that is you know og mortal Kombat, street fighter you had all these characters to choose from um mortal Kombat. more than often i played as a character raiden do i look like a white guy with you know electricity coming out of my eyes i don't think so but when you make representation the only thing that's where the problem comes in. And that's what Black Girl Gamers is doing. And it looks like if you do not want to blame everything on white people, if you do not want to be, that's not your thing. If you're just like, you know what? We, no, that's that's not it. They'll get rid of you. Just like they... Uh, and and can her. I take it one step further? You know what it tells me about all of these people, this and that other group, uh, Sweet Baby, whatever? They're mm -hmm. not about providing quality and service. They're about their brand. They're not saying we're better than the other people who do this kind of work. They're saying we're blacker than the other people who do this work or we're women or that. That's what they're selling is it's like uh, Hunter Biden. You know, nobody hired him to be an executive of an oil company because he had vast experience. They were selling the brand. Uh, mm -hmm. And that tells you to me, when these people do this, it tells you they know they can't compete on quality. They know they can't compete on talent. They're saying, well, we're kind of mediocre, but if we come out this way, boy, we can carve out a place for ourselves. And that's their hustle. That's their positioning statement or whatever you want to call it. That's the only thing they've got to compete with. By the way, notice content, events, Consulting, and then way at the end of it, talent. Uh, yes. If yes. talent was so good, wouldn't it be first? Or would people see their talent and say, eh, that's not very talented. It's not as good as these other guys. Thanks. Goodbye and be gone. You would think so. But it's just like, here's where I call BS on this stuff, that there were plenty of people out there in this type of industry, in gaming, they weren't worried about quote unquote representation just to do representation or the representation the way they might want it to be. And when you look at this and you're absolutely right, Lou, it's not about putting out a good product. It is about indoctrination. You know, they're not doing stuff like, you know, eh, maybe this storyline's missing this, this part doesn't add up. You know, your protagonist needs to have their role more fleshed out. This boss level needs to be more competitive. Yeah, yeah, they're not yeah. doing that type of thing. They're not doing where it's like, eh, you know, you may need to plus that up somewhere. Or, you know, hey, you know, if you're going to have someone who's of Asian descent in the game, you might want to have their face reflect Asian features a bit better. Stuff like that. But when you're saying that you have to, and let me go down here to Forspoken because I did not buy this freaking game at all because of how crappy it looked. So apparently Black Girl Gamers, they were hired to consult on Forspoken, which explains a lot of things. So they're saying Frey is a female of Black descent. Okay. Colorism like and texturism? Colorism and texture. I thought I'd heard all the isms. Those are new for me. No. 
No. Colorism, basically the whole light skin versus dark skin thing. Texturism, discrimination against hair textures. Here's my oh. thing. I'm playing a game so I can escape into and have fun. What makes you think that I want to deal with these issues when I'm just trying to have fun and play a game? I'm because imagining you have something you want to have basement with their PlayStation or their Nintendo, and they're in the middle of the game and they're shooting and they're having fun. And one of them says, Gosh, look at how great her hair is. I don't think that happens to you. I don't think that happens. <laughs> And apparently, Forspoken was so bad that they had to shut down the game studio. If I remember oh, right. wow. Yeah. These people got paid up front. I oh, it. yeah. Yeah. They got, their, uh, they got their money. But it's interesting. It's just uh -huh. like, if this is what you do, don't be ashamed of it. Just put it out there. But you're spinning as if you're not doing what your website says that you do. You're basically trying to tell gamers, you know, we're going to piss on your leg and tell you that it's raining, to quote Judge Judy, who I love very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any last thoughts about this one before we move on to our main event, so to speak? Well, I'll, I'll say this. I, I'm not a gamer. And but I've been um, I, I do admire gamers and um, admire the gaming industry. I know a lot. Uh, I know about a lot of games, but um, I, I'm not a gamer, so I'll put that out there. This story just keeps on cycling in and out of the news, and it's really disturbing because some of the language that I'm hearing is just so aggressive. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about something with the name "game" in it, which is sounds fun and exciting, but we're talking about words like purge and terrify yeah. that I keep hearing. And that doesn't have, that is not congruent uh, with the idea of, of gaming. Also, why not make games for everyone where you have a game, which is, you know, you know, just uh, whatever color you want them to be. Uh, or uh, why not try to develop more games with their ideal, but make it good. Make it so good that people want to play that game. Now that's really interesting because, oh, go, go ahead, no, culture. No, no, I, no, I'm not gonna interrupt you, you're on a roll. Keep going, keep going. Okay, like why not do that? Because I think that oversees all of this BS, all of this verbiage that we're seeing, all of this uh, um, anger that's being, kind of, uh, uh, you know, promoted in, in public spaces. And I really feel like they all need uh, a PR person to help them with communicating with the public. Because right now it's just, it's just really going downhill fast. They, they don't seem to have the words to really, um, uh, to, to really describe what it is that they're doing and they're attacking um, people online and Talking about purging an entire group of people sounds pretty awful. I, I've never thought I would I would hear somebody say that out loud. This this just keeps reminding me of something that's becoming more and more true every single day. If people are going to tell you who they are, let them. Mm -hmm. Let them. You know, let let the person who is determined to be your enemy make the mistakes let them you know and and then and then here we are we can dine out on this stuff forever because it's like look you, you talk all a good game but every single action you take as you pointed out belies you know your 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 you know what your stated goals are you are you you are a, you know hi hypocritical in the extreme i look if i started using language like that i don't think you guys would associate with me could you imagine me saying something that dangerous yeah no oh. I, I would also <laughs> like to say this one last thing too um i think a lot of people don't like the idea of being manipulated subtly or in some sort of strange propaganda and that's what it feels like when you hear that these companies have been 
uh, consulted by uh, co certain constituents to change the nature of what they initially planned to produce. So it, it is uh, it is something in human nature. We just don't like that. We don't like that. And um, I think then they may need to reanalyze their strategy of how what they're doing and how it's really not pleasing and or not pleasant for people to want to join in or to support because this is really um I, I would say there's a moral issue here that I think is not being addressed. And and, and, and there's a financial issue and that is this. Ooh. These people never say that by using their services you'll sell more games. Never. It's you'll be righteous and you'll be true and you'll follow the, the dogma and you'll be better and we won't blacklist you if you don't. If if and I don't know much about the gaming industry, but I have to think that if, if you took the 100 or 500 gaming company clients of all these people mm -hmm. and you said to them, listen, I can deliver for you uh, as many sales as Mario Brothers has had. And you'll get your own theme park land at Universal and all the other goodies. Only thing is, you got to make it about two Italian guys in a Japanese story fighting with a gorilla. Is that okay with you? Hell yes. If I can have Nintendo's success, it's okay with me. Is that what you're selling? No, 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 no. I'm selling that you'll be righteous with Italians. Why? It's, it's, these people not only are not doing what's good for their bottom line, they don't care. No, they because really do not. They're they're about selling a philosophy, and they're about telling anybody they can't and a philosophy that they cannot even logically convince or explain to people. They have to threaten them to get them to get it, or tell them you will eat the bad ice cream because we have told you to eat it and we're morally superior to you. Exactly. And they wonder why they're going broke. Well, that might have something to do with it. I don't well, want to eat the bad ice cream. I want good ice cream. Well, yeah. You know, their opinions are, I think their opinions are fine. But what what I have a big issue and I think is the, the part that everyone's kind of like really disturbed about is that that it is sort of moving underneath the current and and, and showing up in places where, wait, wait a minute, how did this get here? Um, yeah. And it's mm -hmm. it's not what people people feel the influence and they feel the propaganda and it it doesn't feel nice um, instead of it being a fun experience to go gaming and to to just um, escape reality for a few minutes you're getting all the reality kind of in your face where did how did this show up you know and you make a great you make a very great point retro nerd girl because one of the things that I said is that for years I wasn't really in the gaming space. Just life just got crazy. Professional life just got crazy. But I bought a lot of freaking video games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a lot of games. And when I started to get back into gaming, it was just like, what the heck happened with these games coming out that are all about the message? And it's not about good gameplay and it wasn't just one game it wasn't just two games it wasn't three games it seemed to be prevalent with all of them and case in point when hogwarts legacy came out and then you saw how certain groups like this acted it's like okay you know once is a coincidence well we'll say once is an anomaly two mm -hmm. is a coincidence three is a pattern and these patterns are just running all, all freaking over the place. So, uh, folks, I, I agree. It's just Lorena, like you have to push against us. You know the famous scene in Goldfinger when he's strapped to the table and the laser's coming up his crotch and he says, do you expect me to talk? And he says, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. <laughs> well, in the book, the dialogue is almost what you just said. In the book, remember, he's met him at the golf course and he's had the fracas with him on the roads there in Switzerland. And now there they are. And in the book, Goldfinger, who's much more associated with mafia guys in the book, says they have a saying in Chicago, Mr. Bond, once is accident, twice coincidence, third time, enemy action. Goodbye. Yes. 
<laughs> that is so oh my gosh that is that is so that's so absolutely absolutely true which is going to bring us to our next topic Ooh. and first of all thank you 37 of you folks here in the oh, chat hey. thank you barry on for this 20 dollar oh, super wow. chat so generous thank you so so very much says lorena off topic wife got tired of winter Where's a good place to live within an hour of Orlando or Tampa? Rural-ish would be nifty as I've gotten used to it, but I think Ocala is out of range. Well, thank you so much, my dear. Um, one recommendation that I would make would be uh, St. Cloud, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Kissimmee is starting to just get really, really crowded, full of people. I was going to say, make it an hour and a half and you can find something a little less crazy expensive and a little less congested. An hour is sort of still within the zone, isn't it, nowadays in Orlando, especially? Uh, it, 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 it depends. It's getting there. It, it could, it, it's getting there. So St. Cloud is, I think, a little bit over an hour, but the trade-off is worth it. There's plenty. It's, I look at it and it's real Florida. So that's, uh, that's one. Um, consider, consider Claremont because of the highway access to Orlando driving yes. in. Yeah. I mean, that's where I was looking for land for the longest time. There's lots of water. If you're into lakes, there's lots of water there. It's a good yeah. choice. Claremont so. and St. Cloud are kind of like the same thing. There's, you know, lots of lots of space. There's highway access. I think with Claremont, I forget which one it is there, but I know with St. Cloud, you've got access to the Florida Turnpike. Yeah, I mean, and and then again, I mean, if you if you don't plan on traveling around a bunch, you can always look at the nice places. Um, the thing is, is it's only as deep as your wallet because. Yeah. You know, I mean, I nearly bought a house, and Doctor Phillips probably should have. Would have quadrupled my no. money, but uh, yeah, I looked at Doctor Phillips. I'm like, oh my god, yeah. goodness, goodness, goodness. Mm -hmm. Louis Vieira, hello, says, where is a representation for a Peruvian with Chinese, African, and Spanish roots? Not to mention, four generations ago, I got to do as well. <laughs> Luis, I, Luis, I don't know, because uh, I mean, for me. I'm a Heinz 57, so I'm unfortunately I'm white presenting, so I'm never going to get any of the little perks of, you know, these DEI things. So. Uh, Peruvian, uh, it's, in it's interesting because uh, I also I, I went to a restaurant Japanese. not far from Disneyland that was a Mexican restaurant, uh, and actually, pardon me, it was a Chinese restaurant, and almost everybody who worked there was Mexican, and they all learned Chinese, so they could yes. Talk. Oh wow! So you know, there you go, and that was a weird scene. All Wait, these is that the one? From... Is that the one that's like right off a of walnut, over by the Crystal Cathedral? Actually, oh, if you know okay. where that is. Yeah, yeah but oh, uh, okay, uh, okay, the melting pot, indeed. Yeah, I remember when um, P.F. Chang's first oh. uh, appeared. I was out in L.A., and the joke was P.F. Chang's. Chinese restaurant chain owned by white guys and the staff are all Mexican. Yeah, well. <laughs> that uh, food was banging too. I'm not even <laughs> it's funny, it's funny though. In, A lot of people like that. Pot, in Southern California, there are certain ethnicities that monopolize certain trades. For example, if you want to get any kind of appliance fixed, nine times out of ten in LA, it's a Russian or an Armenian. I don't know why that is. But all the stove and laundry and everything repair guys are Russian and Armenian. Mm -hmm. uh, and they just are. I don't know why, but uh, good for them, you know. That's kind of like when I would go to get my nails done in, you know, in L.A. when I used to get that done. Because back in Philly, I don't know how this got decided. I don't know what kind of draft was going on. But in Philly... The nail salons are predominantly owned by Koreans, but in LA, Vietnamese. predominantly owned by Vietnamese. I'm Vietnamese like, Vietnamese and Cambodian. Oh, wow. Yeah. It, it well, tripped me out because I'm just like, uh, I'm just We have to Korean. remember how <laughs> relatively recent all of this is. Back in the, would have been the middle 70s, uh, a friend of mine from Salinas, California, went to Princeton for college. And after she'd been there about two weeks, calls me up in tears. I said, Bro. She says, I went to what was supposed to be a Mexican restaurant in 
you know, New Jersey there someplace. Mm -hmm. And she says, they served me what they called enchiladas. It was manicotti with cilantro on top. <laughs> oh, that's Cause there oh, wow. What, there wasn't El Torito and everybody else on every corner back then. There just wasn't, you know, not that long ago. So, uh, uh, and I remember um, uh, Olive Garden. Olive Garden, mm -hmm. for one thing, everybody used to put their test restaurant when they had a new concept, the big chains, in Orlando because they got such a cross-section of people from all over the country to come in and they could test out things. Mm -hmm. And what they learned in Orlando with the very first Olive Garden was that they had to have two different red sauces. The West Coast was all about marinara sauce and the East Coast was all about meat sauce. And otherwise, the menus in Olive Garden were exactly the same, but everything on the West side of the country was vegetarian, you know, or a, a, a marinara sauce, and everything on the east side was meat sauce. Go figure. Uh, it's one of the joy of, of restaurant research. Anyway, anyway ah! meanwhile, back at research. Yeah, back here to uh, this article from Variety. Now, I will, I will preface this by saying the quotes are coming from an article in the Financial Times. The Financial Times used to be worth a damn, but it's not, you know, anymore. That article is behind a paywall. So most people are not going to go behind a paywall to see it. You can't even bring it up on archive.org. But here we have with Variety saying, Disney board foe, Nelson Peltz questions woke Marvel films. Why do I have to have a Marvel movie that's all women? Why do I need an all black cast? Seems a little inflammatory, don't you think? Yeah, well, we, we can't fault his logic. We can't fault his attacks on our business practices. We can't fault anything else about him. So let's, you know, call him racist because that's what people do. Mm. And, and, and frankly, as clever as he is, he shouldn't have given that interview to someplace that's behind a paywall because it makes it harder for people to see the truth of what he said. That was yeah. a mistake. Yeah, I look, I'm not going to I'm not leaning into this at all because I know better. Um, one of the things that I that bums me out is how poor journalism is these days, because this the reason variety is twisting it this way is because mm -hmm. it serves their purposes. Yeah. And yep. I'm quite sick and tired of it. I think everybody else is as well. So um, Disney's got major problems. Nobody can argue that. Um, Pelt wants to come in and fix them. Seems like a reasonable thing. Um, I, you know, I've, I've got a video coming out maybe tonight or early tomorrow morning covering what first American legal just did. And I'm going to, yeah, gonna, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to send the fancy scrolling version to the people here in private so that you can go through it quickly. But Disney has introduced so many different ways that they can, they they basically are putting their shareholders at risk that it's a problem. So you need a mind like Nelson Peltz or maybe two or three of them. Um, you know, and they're scared of they're scared of two guys out of ten, or two board members, I should say, out of ten, mm -hmm. having different ideas. That's not good. You, you one of the reasons films are good, and Lou can tell you this, or television programs, is because not everybody agrees on everything. Yeah. And you fight for what's going to be the best. Some of the best scenes that you'll ever see in television are, you know, the, the result of an argument, either in a writer's room or even all the way at the at the production level where, you know, the cameras are rolling and people are like, I'm not shooting the scene this way. It yeah. doesn't fit my character. And, you know, it, it, but when it comes to the boardroom, you have to have a diversity of ideas because right now you have a board with a history of failure. Stop it. Anyway, yeah. Sorry. No, got, that, that, that's that's, no, that's no, the no. bottom line. And by the way, if we want to make any aspersions about people's ethnic uh, predilections or otherwise, I got to tell you, as a member of the tribe, the level to which the vitriol has come out of Disney against Ike Perlmutter might just tell me that they've got a problem with my people. <laughs> He's... He's only lending his shares. But, oh, that argumentative, that nasty, that hectoring, that. And, uh, you know, it came Not this good. close to K-I-K-E. So, <laughs> you know, 
uh, it's it's pretty obvious to a lot of my friends too. Reading this stuff, they say, "Well, we know what they're saying, don't we?" So, anyway, anyway, this is this is so so damn silly. It's it's uh, it's it is, and the culture, just like you were saying, the state of I don't even want to say journalism. Um, journalism, not really. It's not. It, it's what sorry. <laughs> journalism. You said. Your, journalism, digital fish wrap is what I like to because <laughs> I because I, I tell you I, I called the L.A. Times fish wrap when it was a physical you know physical paper kind of like the Orlando Sentinel actually they're both you know barely worthy to be called fish wrap but that's what these sites are and outlets like Variety, the Hollywood Reporter, and to an extent Deadline and the Wrap as well. Pelcher's a Hollywood, no, nah, sorry, 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 sorry. Iger's a Hollywood guy. You got to remember that. And these trades love blowing smoke up his ass. And, <sighs> the, and even without knowing that this article that they're quoting came from another article, just from the headline and how it's set up, I know what they're going for. They're going for this emotional reaction to basically say, oh, that pelt, he's a misogynist, he's a he's a racist. How dare he ask, you know, these kind of questions? But the interesting thing, and I put this on uh, I put this on Twitter, actually replied into Variety's thread. And Ooh. once again, we're back to day zero of me not being called racist. Uh, I said racist <laughs> again. Oh. You gotta stop again? that, Lorena. You gotta stop. Again? What are you doing <laughs> Control yourself. Control yourself. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's ridiculous. So I replied. I basically say, um, I have the same questions. Oh no. See, I'm not allowed to have that opinion. You know, I'm not allowed to say <laughs> the type of thing. Like, why do we have to have these all female movies just to just to have them? There's nothing wrong with a female-led movie. Bridesmaids is one of my favorite. Uh, no, well, I was going to say white chicks, but that's that's a different flavor. I, I do love movies like that. <laughs> um, that's some quality entertainment right there. But Bridesmaids, I thought was flipping hilarious. I loved that darn movie. That was a female uh, female-led movie. Um, but it was good. It was funny. Okay, at least to me. I thought it was hilarious. It did its job. It was fun. It was entertaining. It was funny. Okay. But when you drop women in a Marvel film, like that cringe ass scene in Endgame, yeah. and everyone could tell, you guys know exactly the scene I'm talking about. I mean, the battle yep. rage and it's cool. We're looking we're like, over here, over here, the thing. And it's just kind of like, hey, boys, let me, let us take over for you and it's just like uh, what the hell is and people in the theater were like what the frick grown, is this it's grown. insulting too uh well, why do you need a special area where are you saying that are you actually saying that the the female characters are weaker because like why why are you singling them out because the, the that's making them look bad that's not making them look great and I, I think it's like after that it, moment, it, and even though people push back on it, push back on that scene in particular, they just said, we're going to do the whole Disney, every single Disney movie and, and, and television project just like that scene. And you can't say that we don't notice that it's happening because now we have just like those other stories you you mentioned earlier that there are companies that are consulting and changing things behind the scenes to make this all happen so and now we're not crazy oh somebody is doing something mm -hmm. behind the scene this is this is propaganda and and this is not creative art like we want to actually consume you know, it's it's very angering and upsetting. And so his statements, they look really bad. That's not I don't think that's the way he intended to. He he's asking a question like, why do you need to have uh, this in order to make uh, a good quality item? Why aren't we just making great stories? Yeah. And that scene in, in uh, Endgame, whatever, it's like, go sit at the kids table. Yes. Isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? It's like, oh, you you kids go over there and play. 
Uh, it's so condescending. And, and the obvious question about that lady on the left is how come it didn't make any money? And to me, the fact that it was all girls wasn't as bad as when that girl said, oh, so you're to the little young teenager. Oh, you're married to uh, so-and-so. That scene was really insidious. I think. Um, but what do I know? You know, but he, he's saying, why don't, why don't we make good movies first? And by the way, if the whole point of the movie is to do it all black or all women or all whatever, that's probably not going to make a good movie. Period. Especially when you're leading with agenda and message first and entertainment second or way down the list or basically, you know, creativity by committee. And I think that that's, that's the crux of the question that Peltz is asking, which we regular everyday people, we get that. It's just like you throw out these you know, movies like the Marvels, for example, where you basically sell it by saying, oh, it's an all-female movie. It doesn't work. It well, does not it, work. And women didn't show up to see that. And, and you know what it's like, frankly, it's like Beyonce putting on a cowboy hat and suddenly being a country singer. No, mm -hmm. we didn't, that, that didn't work very well. No, I didn't <laughs> go well, dude. You know, yeah. I remember when, when I was a kid, Sorry, and cousin. And looking, uh, the toilet <laughs> cart did a, quote, unquote, the black Mikado where they did a, a show of the Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan, all black. It was okay, but it was a gimmick. It was a gag. It was it was a one shot. It wasn't, and from now on, so is Pirates of the Penzance, and so is everybody else. In the, you know, it, it, these stunt deals, when they become the, the, the norm instead of a stunt, uh, people sort of notice and say, oh, that's one of those. I don't think I'll go. I don't think I'll go. Well, I'll add another another one um, to this. And actually, let's <laughs> go down here to what he said. The 81-year-old Pelt, who has yeah. admitted he never claimed to have experience in the media business, made comments mm -hmm. about the Marvels and Black Panther in a recent interview with the Financial Times. Why do I have to have a Marvel movie that's all women? Pelt asked rhetorically. Not that I have anything against women, but why do I have to do that? And why can't I have marbles that are both? Why do I need an all black cast? Now, let me use Black Panther and Wakanda Forever um, as examples since uh, mm -hmm. y'all went through this up there. Because apparently they say Black Panther does not have an all black cast, nor does the marbles have an all female cast. Well, here's the thing the lead actors. The stars in the Marvels, the stars in Black Panther and Wakanda Forever, the top tier stars, the faces that sell the movies, those are all women and those are all Black. However, we're going to talk about Wakanda Forever and Black yeah. Panther. Okay, Black Panther. Even I know who he was. A lot of people knew who he was. His whole arc in the Marvel comics, big deal wanting to see that on screen that movie when that movie came out for halloween because that's usually what you can see what you know what the kids are like of course you know you have a whole bunch of darth vaders and everything but i saw kids of boys of all races mm -hmm. dressed up oh yeah like black panther because at the crux of the movie black panther it was a story about a man and his father Okay, that was the crux, a universal story that appeals to everyone, which is why that movie made so much darn, you know, so much money. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a predominantly black cast, but the story was very universal. And on top of that, you had a strong male character, which is why the toys sold like crazy, why you couldn't even keep Black Panther toys on the shelves. Kids, you know, we're buying kids of all races. We're, we're buying them. And they love Lean Back Panther. Now, let's switch over to Wakanda Forever, a Black Panther movie without Black Panther in it. And what do you do to the character? You have him die of some disease. And who do you have take over the mantle? Not temporarily, not having Black Panther show up later on the film. You give it to his sister. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> what does that say? What you're saying about black men that they're just disposable? Is that is is that the message you're trying to give Disney? Because according to the box office, uh, a lot of folks didn't appreciate that. It's what you call a twofer. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just looked it up because I was curious. You know what year Black Panther first showed up in Marvel Comics? Want to guess? Uh, somewhere between the 60s and the 70s. Mm -hmm. I was going to say 67 or 68. Number 52 in July of 1966. That was a big deal in 1966. Mm -hmm. But that was 1966. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and not only that, uh, there was this other group called the Black Panthers back then. <laughs> they were yeah. fighting against the wind. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know. Wait a minute. Um, what? No. What? No. I mean, little did we know that someday they would have a girl grow up from them that wound up suing Donald Trump in Georgia. Uh, <laughs> you know, her father was a Black Panther. Mm -hmm. uh, what's her name? Uh, Fanny. 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 Fanny girl. Anyway, uh, I'm just saying they're trying to make, oh, God, we were so groundbreaking to do this movie. Oh. Uh, Stanley did it 50 years ago. Sorry, forget it. Nice. Thank you for trying. But, uh, and again, they didn't say we've got a great new character. You're going to love him. It's a great movie. They said, mm -hmm. he's a great new all black character. That's what matters. Why does that matter? That's what he's really saying. Why does it matter? Why should that be the standard by which we make, promote, and judge an entertainment? Also Isn't look that at, racist? But but also to look at look at his sentence, what he says, why do I have to have? Yeah. Meaning no one has provided the answer for him to want this. I mean, it doesn't look exciting, it doesn't seem inviting, it doesn't seem interesting. By the and way, so, that part I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to Oh no, no, no. But uh, you know, when I um when the Marvels were coming out, uh, this is this is this could have been a really monumentous moment for um, for for women in uh, in soup in a superhero movie to have three superheroes really lead and take charge and all that mm -hmm. stuff. But even the posters were subpar. the uh, The trailer was not really interesting. Uh, I, I don't think there was anything exciting or inviting to get me to go to the theater to go see that movie. You mean or, the live endless oh. stream of cats didn't convince you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have. <laughs> that should have gotten me right there. For a second, Lorena, because when he says he never claimed to be an expert on uh, media or whatever the line was. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that he and his guys went to the parks and they had a good time, but it all looked a little shopworn and shoddy. And then he mm -hmm. had that bit about the $16 balloon. How much media experience as a businessman do you have to know that 16 bucks for a balloon is a ripoff and that people are going to resent it? And that yeah. selling people at several hundred dollars a day, something that's shopworn and run down, that people are going to say, I don't need to come back to this again for that kind of money. You don't need to be a media genius to see that they're doing stuff wrong. You need to be somebody who, amongst all those board members who never mentioned a balloon in their lives, says, excuse me, guys, I'm just going to ask a simple question. Why do we charge $16 for a balloon? Oh, that's a cheap one. Yeah. I've seen what the one that I wanted <laughs> was 20 bucks. I'm just saying nobody even asked those questions. You know, people, when this whole thing began, people said to me, well, what can two guys or one guy do on that board? I said they can ask the questions that aren't being asked. They can they can be, you know, for, for better or worse, as they say, the turd in the punch bowl who says, uh, what if we're wrong? What if that isn't the right way to do it? What if? Has anybody considered the consequences if we do it a different way? And the answer will come back, no, because we're geniuses and everything we do is right and screw you. And that's their attitude. That's how you go broke. Culture, you look like you're 
Ray just say yeah. something. I well, Lou's covering a lot of ground, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's just I look. I I don't know what to do. I can't. I can't. I can't say I agree with you every time you say something. Sure, you can. Uh, make well, you feel I could, good. but then we'll be <laughs> No, nah, it's it's fine. It's just it, 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 because both you and and Retro Nerd Girl have said what I feel about like the Marvel specifically. Everything about that film was done wrong from the script, the cast, the marketing, everything. It, it, because the only emphasis that they had was on women, women director, women writer, women this, women that. Okay, I mean, valiant effort, but you've seen what the results of that, those types of efforts are. And you've seen the results of when you market those efforts the way that you did what usually happens people are done with this culturally divisive stuff and you know i said something earlier in the show that probably got clipped and it just happens to be accurate about certain parties <laughs> mm -hmm. but this is this is the thing we're all suffering under overeducated uh you know pseudo intellectuals of you know a, a particular pallor uh, that happened to lean into some political ideology that it really is against well, family and everything else that Disney's supposed to represent. And, you know, it's it, it. I feel like we all talk about this in our videos, but we don't come out and say it. Disney was a family company. They're not anymore. Oh, that the, the, that is 100 uh, yeah. percent correct. I yeah. mean, when there used to be a time where you could put on the Disney Channel and it was just wholesome, family-friendly entertainment. Yes, some of it was kind of cheesy, but we liked the cheese. It was safe entertainment for your kids to watch and for families to watch to watch together because that's what Walt Disney with, did the whole thing with his entertainment was that the family could enjoy it and it would reflect love for it, the American family. That was the brand that sold around the world. Now, okay, Disney, my, my sister's kids, they, I tell her, like, do not, except for Bluey, they don't watch anything on that channel. Why? Mm. Let's see, between uh, LGBTQIA, Skittles Nation, propaganda being pushed, you've got, let's see, uh, the character Baymax finding tampons for a, a transgender woman, um what all yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah that happened in there i forget which other which other one you have to watch jonas j camp yeah jonas oh, yeah he, jonas's channel uh, everything woke about is a yes. way to get educated yeah. and to educate others on the rampant ideology that is so prevalent in the material it's ridiculous it's ridiculous in K and uh to contrast things like i told my told my sister because my sister said uh i made the mistake of watching the new proud family i said yeah that was a mistake <laughs> the original <laughs> yes huge mistake the original proud family okay you want to talk about diverse characters okay they had that in the proud family at the crux of that disney channel show geared towards families was a nuclear black family you had extended relatives sugar mama i freaking loved her literally she said i put my foot in this in it. <laughs> she, she literally put, put, in put it. her yeah. foot you know oh, uh in the you know in in the dish but it was something that everyone could watch even when they had the rosa parks episode where penny went back in time and it was the 50s and during segregation and when she came back her whole thing was i'm so glad that the way that we live now we don't live that way mm -hmm. because we've learned how to live together what a powerful message that that show sent that's why it was so popular now no it's all agenda driven you know, white people are just, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's nowhere near. So culture is 100% right. And I need to bring this out more in my videos when I talk. It is going away from being a family company, yet they expect for families to spend money on this. And families are canceling Disney Plus. Um, families are going to the parks, but you almost feel like you have to look for where's the agenda 
in what you're seeing when you're going, you know, to the shows, case in point, and I'm going along a little bit, case in point, like the Finding Nemo show, when they announced that they were going to update that show, where it's like, what, what, are, what are they going to do? The jokes were like, is, you know, are they going to make Nemo transgender or whatever? But there was a <laughs> lot of trepidation about that show. But when it came back, the only things that really changed is they took the acrobatics out. They plussed up the sets. You know, they put a few more conservation messages, you know, that were in there that, that were good. But in uh, all in all, the show is safe for families. But the fact that you had to think that in the beginning. Well, there was that, that guy who owned a theater in the Midwest somewhere who contacted Pro and said, I'm getting phone calls from parents saying, is it safe to bring my kids to Disney yes. movies? That never happened before. Never. That never happened before. Never. And that's never. why DreamWorks is killing it with the family market. I mm, continue yeah. to predict, and I may be crazy, but I think Comcast Universal is going to sell off, spin off, and otherwise get rid of NBC. because They don't need the power. They just don't need it. Um, and by the way, I wish I was as optimistic as this author, but while we were listening to you talk, which was great, it reminded me of a headline I saw, and I pulled up the article. You want to hear a headline? Twilight of the Wonks, the 100-year reign of impeccably credentialed but utterly mediocre meme processors is coming to an end. <laughs> Hope so. But isn't that impeccably credentialed, but utterly mediocre? That's that's ninety <sighs> percent of the people in charge of stuff nowadays. That just uh, and uh, where the rubber hits the road, surprise, they can't deliver. No, they can't, and yet wonder why foreign films are making money. Godzilla mm. minus one okay. is smashing records. You've got anime films that are coming to theater. Reissues of other movies. Yeah. You know, like the well, original. I was, I was wondering whether I think that this new Godzilla movie uh, is going to owe a lot of its success to the positive reception to minus zero. Uh, minus one, whatever it was, I forget which, but it was yeah, it was minus, minus one. one. Minus, minus zero one. was the black and white reissue. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That's it. I'm sorry, but uh, right. but at the same time, as much money as they'll make, they didn't have only 35 people doing the effects, did they? No, like, and that's the like other. The, yeah, that's the other problem, Lou. I mean, you just hit the the nail on the head. They spent 100 and 185 million or something on the new Godzilla X Kong. Or mm -hmm. something yeah. like that. They're trying, yeah. but but they think that out the gate that's going to make 135 million global on its first opening weekend. So you know they might have a better shot of recovering their budget in three weeks, and then you know be able to, or, or not their budget, but their 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 production costs and promotion mm -hmm. costs in three weeks, and then be able to actually earn some profit on it. Mm -hmm. And it's you know at the same time, I mean it the world we live in when it comes to the box office numbers is 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 all governed by the extraordinary and exploding budgets that I think have more in them that is not movie related than anything okay, else. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well that's what I'm always saying when when the when Valiant Renegade and the rest of the guys quote these numbers out of the British tax uh, filings. That's only below the line stuff and money spent over there. That's not the executives. That's not the stars. That's not the director. That's not whatever post production doesn't happen there, but happens back here. Uh, all of which are more highly paid than anybody I just mentioned that does happen over there. So you ain't seen nothing yet, as they say, when you get into the real numbers of these things. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, speaking of real numbers, I'm going to. Show you guys one thing before we get to our last topic. Now, this one's hot off the presses. Yeah. Yeah. We won't say we told you so, but we told you so. I, I did a little survey, and I think I put it in there. You like to hear the headlines relating to this story, depending on who wrote the headline. Oh, please do. Business Insider says, oh, well, we should probably explain what it is first. The lawsuit that Disney filed, because how dare you tell us that our dead of night illegal rules that we tried to pass through in the twilight of Reedy Creek were illegal. Uh, and Florida said, no, they were, and we're not accepting them. And Disney's basically said at this point, oh, okay, yeah, I guess so. So it was not, it was a settlement, but Disney got their 
that's handed to them, period. Business Insider, quote, Disney and Florida reach deal, putting their legal war on hold. God bless them for mentioning it ain't over yet because you got all those charges that are coming coming out of the SIFCOD audit, okay? New York Times, Disney ends its fight with DeSantis over resort development, which is, you know, almost conciliatory considering it's the gray lady. LA Times, Disney and DeSantis appointed Florida Oversight Board set a lawsuit. You got to get DeSantis' name in there to remind everybody who the good and bad guys are, see? Mm -hmm. NBC News, New York. Settlement reached in lawsuit between Florida Governor DeSantis, allies, and Disney. And USA Today, is Disney and Ron DeSantis' two-year feud over? Question mark. Company Tourism Board reached major settlement. And then you go to good old PJ Media, which just says, Disney surrenders. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like PJ Day, you know, in 80-point type on the front page of the newspaper. But it just goes to show you. Even something as cut, dried, and obvious as this can be set, spun 17 ways from Sunday, depending on who's covering. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I had a laugh looking at the pixie dust feed that I like to call it on uh, on Twitter. Disney won. I'm like, oh, oh, no, they didn't. No, 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 oh, no. They no, florida no. around what and found out. and. Let's also remember, if this would have gone proceeded to a true lawsuit, I don't think they wanted to deal with that discovery phase either. Well, so, inter oh, sorry, go ahead. No, all I was going to say was when you go down and read the comments and the people that understand what it is and the people that don't, mm -hmm. there was some guy from Brooklyn or said he was in the comments on this thing somewhere when I read it hours ago. Well, you know, Disney, uh, Florida's uh, hell on earth and the taxes are higher and, and people are moving out. And I'm going, no, no, they're actually not. They're moving oh, in. And yeah. oh, well, yeah. DeSantis, blah, blah, blah. no, actually, they now have, what is it, 800,000 plurality in registration for Republicans since he mm -hmm. came in. Uh, and wow, well, you know, Disney, blah, blah, blah. these people just spout this utter BS, and whether it's because they're stupid or they're buying something or whether they're paid, you know, human bots, like all those things that that uh, master of what you call it is discovering. Um, uh, uh, they just they just uh, figured out that uh, they don't need this mm -hmm. aggravation and they're not going to win. You no. don't make a deal unless you're going to lose. It's just that simple, no. guys. And it was the hubris of Disney thinking, you know, hey, we're untouchable. Don't you know who I am? You know? Yeah. That's all these, remember all these videos you see of some local mayor or city council person telling the cops when they pull them over for being drunk, don't you know who I am? I'll have your badge. Yeah, right. Well, I uh, think we had a, I think we had a, an article like that on Welcome to Florida. I think culture, we had video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so funny and true. Bosco scenario. Thank you so much, Guy Star, for that five dollar Canadian super chat. Those two toonies and a loony or five loonies. Thank you. Says Hollywood has taken their fans for granted. International studios know what puts butts in seats, and original stories no rehash. Yeah, mm -hmm. you are one hundred percent right. How many? Um, even on streaming services, oh, I, yeah. I noticed. Say they're retro it's like it's either old school stuff, retro movies or classic movies. I'm watching mostly K dramas, um, Indian films. Mm -hmm. This is why Netflix is just raking it up because that was their model for a long time. They did, everybody saw how successful they were doing, and now they're following suit. Uh, Warner mm -hmm. Brothers just grabbed a whole bunch, and so did so did um, Disney, and it's like. Uh, you know, th these are different stories, right? They, you don't have to deal with any of the politics of what's going on in America because they're from they're from another culture altogether. They're 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 out to entertain their their people, and and that's what we want. We want stories that entertain. Yeah, I, I and, just and I think someday when the great history of all this is written. With all the mistakes that Iger's made and all the miscues and all the wrong directions this company has gone in, ultimately, the biggest, biggest money losing and 
a direction losing and every other kind of losing decision was saying, well, let's go with China instead of India. If they had done in India what they did in China, mm -hmm. not that India is perfect. It's a, it's a relatively kleptocratic I, I was thinking this society, the other day. I was but, thinking this the other day because they have the population. Uh, well, they've got the population. They've got people who want to consume media. Uh, one little thing, a sort of preview for folks who might also be here and also be members at, uh, at uh, the Pro Channel. Um, next week on the Genre Guys, at my insistence, because the other two guys, Lauren and, and Tommy, didn't really want to, but I insisted, and I'll send you guys the link, I happened to find something totally out of left field. And what it is, when we did Action Jackson in memory of wonderful Carl Weathers, mm -hmm. I found out there is a Bollywood movie called Action Jackson. You told me. I heard it about has, this. It has yeah. nothing to do with the other movie except the name. It is the greatest dang thing. It is two and a half hours of fun. It's big action. It's big wire work. It's big explosions. And then they all stop and dance and sing for a while. And then they go back to that. And <laughs> it's just it's just a thrill ride of fun. And uh, we're doing that for April Fool's next week. So, uh, nice. And nice. it's free. It's, and by the way, no subtitles. It's all Ooh. in Hindi with no subtitles, and it's on YouTube. And about every 25th word is English, you know, and doesn't matter what it's about or what you can follow. It's just fun for fun's sake. And God bless them. They understand that. And we should learn it again. Absolutely. Yeah. And another another thing that I'll that I'll offer up, which I think is extremely interesting because it's uh it's actually on uh on Hulu. I know. I know it's on Hulu. <laughs> if you are a fan of the original miniseries from way back in the day that would show up in syndication, no. you will freaking love Shogun. I cannot tell you enough how just enjoyable this series is. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Hiroyuki Sonata having production control and creative control over it. Because I don't know if some of you saw on Twitter, because you know you got that uh, peanut gallery out there. They're like, how come there aren't any black people in Shogun? I'm like, there are so many. <laughs> Why do we freaking care? You might I'm as well like, ask, how come there's no Japanese uh, samurai in uh, Shaft? Uh, exactly. <laughs> it, it was like the dumbest thing. I'm like, no, 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 no. We just want to watch, be immersed, wrapped up in this, you know, and this is historical, uh, historical fiction. And it is absolutely freaking amazing to just sit there and enjoy and be entertained. And the acting is so good. I mean, I forget, I forget the subtitles. Forget that it's subtitled because a lot of it is subtitled in English because the, yeah. the you know the it's being spoken in Japan you know in Japanese for most of it you get some of the translation between um, uh, I believe it's Marco and John Blackthorn when they speak in English but the majority of it is like you're just sitting there just watching like the last one had um, actually had some uh, I think it's Kabuki theater that was in it and. I don't know any any Japanese, but just fascinated by what by what I'm seeing. So it's like a oh thank you, thank you guys, Gar Miracle. Yes. This is the type of entertainment that people want. You know, they want they want to be they want to be entertained. And the more stuff that comes out like this, it's uh well, Disney can't say that. Although, although Iger did bring it up in the last investor call, like, oh, of course, and Shogun is doing well. Yeah, because that's FX and Hiroyuki Sonata, you know, at his insistence that the majority of the actors were Japanese, you mm -hmm. know, that it would be authentic. Oh, again, yeah, Michaela Clavel. Yes, I did. I did see that. I did see that. I did see that. That was... That was my thing. 
so glad that she that she was involved. You know, uh, with that. Clavel is in that group of writers that you can think of, like uh, Michener and uh, Leon Uris, uh, who wrote these great character pot boilers and put them in a historical context and made them real. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a talent we seem to have lost too, as far as the writing side. Although maybe I'm just not aware of some good ones. I'd love to be. Um, I would say you're not wrong. I mean, when I saw Shogun and Syndication, I was so fascinated by this miniseries that I went, checked the book out at my school library, was advised that, you know, as a fourth grader, this is probably too advanced for you to read. Book weighed more than I do. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care, but you had this great literature. I said, I think I read that book and I'm going to say, I think like three weeks or something like that. I was just wrapped up in it. And this great literature that's out there where you can translate that to film, it's 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 something else, and that's definitely part of the appeal. Uh, definitely of Shogun. Hey, Stunt Brat, good hey, seeing you. Brat. And we got Cavertino in here as uh, as well. Oh. So yeah, definitely, definitely check out uh check out check out Shogun. Have you had a chance oh. to see Shogun Culture? I haven't had a moment to do it, um, it because well, I'm usually like on your show or on pro <laughs> show or on that park place or midnight's edge or busy my man. own show yeah so no and, and i've been making <laughs> videos on top of it um but i will get to it it's on my watch list i have um i think i'm about i think i'm about caught up i think i only have 12 things left to try to get to so <laughs> we're getting close well, it'll it'll be waiting like, for schedule. you it'll be waiting for you and you can binge it unlike the rest of us are like and what's the next episode coming and that's actually kind of was my reasoning to not start it i was telling somebody the other day i'm like i'm just gonna wait till it's all out and then i'll watch it because you know I, I, you have to remember i saw the original miniseries way back a thousand sure. years ago yeah as and, did I. and i had to see it in pieces back then as well but um you know the, the, a lot of people are rooting for the idea that this gets a season two and i'm like it's a would be a completely different like feeling it's not the same thing that <laughs> it's it's you're gonna you know you won't have the same stuff no. so yeah anyway it is what it is I, it's, it's like at the dawn of the vhs betamax era i used to tape so many things i'd have this big stack of stuff that i was going to get to someday and you know when i wound up watching it when i was homesick from school I would be basically 24-7 unspooling all this stuff, some of it six months or a year old that I had recorded. But um, that's now, I guess we could do that more. So that's a good thing. And speaking of good things, the ear is back. Yeah. I, 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 I saw this, and this is from WDWmagic.com. Joe Rody confirms he is working with Walt Disney Imagineering. Now, for those of you who do not know, um, Joe Rody, I would say, is the last OG Imagineer who was working for the Walt Disney Company. Thanks to him, we have the Animal Kingdom, which I would say is one of the last undisturbed for right now examples of classic old school Imagineer. And that park is unlike any other that I've ever been to. And I just love going there. It's, it's amazing. The scale, the detail, when you're walking through Harambe market, you feel like you're in Kenya, Africa. When you're walking through oh. the Asia section, you feel just, like you're just in India. Just a queue for Expedition Everest with all of that junk they picked up over there and brought back alive and mm -hmm. kicking. And it's just, it's you you want to stand in the line longer because there's too much to see. How's that? So it's too it's too much in in the queue and and culture because I know you've been in that queue too. You're so busy looking at all the stuff and and the sight gags and it's building. Well, not sight gags, but what you can see filling in the lore and every piece of it while you're looking at all of these amazing things in the queue, it's building up the story and the mythology of the Yeti and the fact that you just may face the Yeti 
Yeah, it 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 was perfectly built. I mean, it, the, the, one of the things you can always tell that whether Joe or um, or Tony had something to do with uh, the Q design is for that very reason, because it was so you, they understood that not only are you on stage or the, you're in the show the moment you enter the entrance gates, but that has to be the, the, the carried through in all the all of the uh, the cues. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, that that d- does the same thing whether you're at Disneyland or Disney World. It's it's you are being led into this story. There's a little bit of lore that goes along with it, more so in Florida than uh, in uh, in California. But um, it's Indiana Jones, one of the other cues that now informs you about oh, what's yeah. going on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great, it, it, the Great Thunder Mountain. Um, you know that still has those same mechanics. I mean, Joe was a Joe was a genius. So was Tony and. Uh, they they both have them back doing master mm-hmm. classes. Yeah, after you know, Rhodey quote unquote retired, but I'm of the opinion of Leaf Culturist too. He got pushed out, and they're they're making him a a Disney legend officially this year. So yes, they're making together. him a Disney legend, and not only that. Him and Miley Cyrus. How's that for a comparison? Oh, uh, <laughs> what a class! If you say uh, I was in the I was in the legend class of 2024, and people say, "Oh, who else? Oh, well, never mind." Uh, well, he's got this picture of himself in front of Walt Disney Imagineering, and I had the very, very good fortune of actually visiting um, Imagineering. I probably would say second to NASA. Visiting Imagineering was just, uh, was mind-blowing for uh, for me. And this was like a couple of decades ago when I was still living in, uh, living in LA. But shortly after uh, Joe's post, who he says here, Captain, do a bit of work at the old farm. So people were kind of like, well, what's what's the deal with this? Is he rehired by Disney? What's what's going on? Well, turns out, according to uh, Walt Disney Imagineering, and they posted on Instagram, says that Joe is leading a series of masterclass work sessions for current Imagineers. Yeah, it's a it's a limited time, as they always say on everything, mm-hmm. um, and just these classes for a while officially. Somebody, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I got a songbird in the background. Um, yeah, I, I'm like master class work session. So, so are you saying? And this is just this is just me. Are you saying that uh, what you've been doing with Imagineering when Barbara Booza was over it, that you guys weren't getting it done? Well, the comparison that came to my mind was everything we read in the D files. Oh, yes, they, the D files. They, they pressured the great old people to feel uncomfortable and get out uh, because, well, we don't need to know anything from you old guys. What do you know? And yet here is something that officially anyway is the reverse. So who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I just, I, I've been having the D files kind of like on my favorites. Like I'm going to go check it out on my watch list, whatever you call it. And, and the queue. And I finally today got a chance to go through it. And I'm like, my jaw dropped. Yeah. Like how many professionals were treated like garbage after many many years of mm-hmm. working mm-hmm. and slaving away at some of our most favorite coveted um like masterpieces i would call them they're so good and um and that's that was just the animation department and i think this was also um a, according to what they were saying was across the board new people fresh faces were coming in and all of the people who had experience were being kicked out uh, and uh, unceremoniously, by the way. And uh, that breaks my heart. It's un-American to do that. I'm sorry. Um, you, you, that, that, that is absolutely horrible to take someone who's been working uh, a job for, for 30 years and, or, or more and just say, hey, well, you're no longer needed by 
And it's it's so much um, history and knowledge for imaginers who haven't been with the company long to study under these greats, because that's where knowledge gets transferred from one generation, you know, to uh, to the other. I know a, one of my dream jobs was to be a Disney Imagineer. Oh, but. I started to see things kind of change. I mean, even when I was in grad school, literally, people were like, well, how much? How do you know so much about lines and everything? I said, well, because for part of my master's thesis, I walked around in the Magic Kingdom and took notes of lines, how many people yeah. went out, how many people came in. I would have to do like a simulation, literally, of the theme park and how people walked. And I actually had to use like a not an escalator, but people didn't walk in straight lines. Right. People never walk in straight lines in nope. parks. So I actually had to use something to kind of try to uh, simulate that. But being in there, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an Imagineer. I had a whole kinds of books of Imagineering. I'd go on the attractions and find out that's how so things awesome. work, how they work. And that's what I wanted to do. But then you start to see the shift in the old stuff isn't worth it anymore. You know, you see old greats getting pushed out of the company, you know, going to work for like Virgin Atlantic after, you know, they give us these amazing things like uh, like the animal kingdom. And you're wondering, are you going, it's like, am I going crazy when I see these new attractions that are like a shell of what, you know, you think of as a Disney standard when it comes to, you know, attractions. It's like you're used to something like Expedition Everest and you get something like well, Cosmic the, the Rewind. Perfect example, of course, is our old favorite, Tiana's Muddy Waters. Uh, and I don't mean the blues, although we'll be singing the blues when we write it, I think. Where they had, what was it, a hundred and some odd animatronics in California and 70 or 80 in Florida. And now it's going to be 30. And mm -hmm. then we see these these renderings of the big finale scene at the end where they took out the riverboat and put in the storefronts or whatever, the plantation. And there's like eight or ten there and five or six in another one. And then it's like, what's left for the rest of the ride? What's left? And sir, static scenery and maybe projections, we don't know. Gosh, that, it wasn't just the music and the plot and the sliding down the hills. It was the atmosphere of all of that stuff going on that made you not only have a great time, but feel like you needed to go write it again because you couldn't possibly see it all the first time. No. I mean, you'd miss stuff. Like, I would always be caught up in looking at the scene where the frogs are, like, spitting water. Yeah. And yeah. the water goes across you know, goes across the boat. And I'm like, wait a minute, we went too fast. I missed, you know, I missed this thing. And you were talking and about the finale when you see the riverboat and this huge cast of animatronics. It's, it's, there's nowhere else. And of course they were it. mostly from America Sings, but thank God they kept them and used them, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. and the level of detail, when you were talking earlier, uh, culture about uh, the uh, pirates in both, both coasts, my father was a manufacturer and was not uh, overtly an artistic or emotional man, although he was a great father and the best ever. When mm -hmm. I took him on Pirates the first time at Disneyland, mm -hmm. the part of the queue that's right up at the front where the boats are coming back up from down below and doing that yeah. circle, yeah, yeah, yeah. he looked down at the water line and saw something I'd been there 15 times and had never seen, which is that along that water line, there are little splatters of brown concrete simulating uh -huh. mud. And yep. he looked at me and he said, you know, there's no mud in the water. It's gotta be clean so everything works. Look at that. And yep. so I thought, it's one thing to say, oh, we ought to do it. They did it. It's one thing to first think of it is, and nobody will ever notice. Oh yeah, my old man did. Uh, it's just the <laughs> level of verisimilitude and of atmosphere and, of, and the proof of it is when it doesn't work, we were in there one time having dinner at the uh, Blue Bayou when the ride shut down and they right. shut off everything and they turned on the work lights. But yes. the one thing they didn't kill was the bug and bird sounds. And I got to nope. tell you, without the music, that was, that was really, <laughs> anyway, anyway. Yeah, it's it's weird because at Disneyland specifically, when you step on the wood planks, you are literally in the middle of the bayou. 
I mean, yeah. it just it's that big of a transition from that one step. And then everything that goes sells that gag. That's what it does. It's it's what Imagineering is. When you're uh, sitting at the restaurant, as you were mentioning, you are in that gag. The best thing to do is to get a waterfront table if you can. If you beg, borrow, and steal. Yep. A bribe. Do what you can to get on that water, on that railing, so that you can enjoy that view. And, you know, then, in the old days, they had a all-girl antebellum gown quartet of violinists who would stand on the steps leading up to the upstairs there and play music while you ate. Oh, wow. Uh, that was just, oh, God. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. Like I, and Scarlet's anniversary party, you know? It was it was great. I hear that, and I think of the cotillions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't give the parasols. And yeah, yeah, all of, all of that stuff. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're bringing back, uh, bringing back Joe Rody. So who knows if any of what he says actually sticks. Yeah. I That's will, the thing. It, it, it sounds like they're in trouble. And this is sort of like the lifeline to maybe if, if somebody could listen to his suggestions, actually take them, um, maybe things can turn around. Um, and, yeah. and they could, I mean, it, living in hope, but it's, it might be too late. <laughs> well, the, the question becomes, do, do the young Imagineers that he tutors during this limited session get all inspired and excited? And when he's gone and they start proposing things based on what they learned, do the supervisors say, yeah, yeah, fine, that's swell, but we're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. If, if this do is just for show. Yeah. This it's it's like, a virtue signaling, exactly. Exactly, because remember the stockholders meeting, the annual yeah. stockholders meeting. How can we forget it? April 3rd. And man, there is blood in the water. That's going to be one. <laughs> so one. It's, almost like, it's almost like, oh, look at this cool thing we're doing. See, look, yeah, we look, are changing. We did, this, we did yeah. this, we did this. Ignore the fact that we, you know, settled with the state of Florida. Uh, all this uh all this other stuff it's it's gonna be uh something else but uh. as always folks time flies on this show and i want to thank you guys for being here and i want to thank my amazing amazing panelist friends for hanging out with me first of all let's go around shout out our channels and let people know where they can find you starting with retro nerd girl Oh, sure. You can find me on YouTube, Retro Nerd Girl. And um, th there you'll find retro movies and uh, and reviews and even watch parties. Uh, come on and hang out with me there and also on Twitter. All right. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Lou Wasserman's ghost, special oh, guest. Where I always, you find you? I always joke and say, wherever there is trouble, you will find it. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever there's adventure, I'll be there, you know, but I'm not a three amigos. I'm only one. Uh, I'm going to be all over the place tomorrow on, uh, I think, on both shows on uh, that park place and the extra uh, pro show. But of course, weekly, uh, Lauren and, and Tommy and I do this wonderful thing called the genre guys. And the current one is just going up today, I think, sometime. Is about uh, the very first James Bond movie, Doctor No, and as Ooh. I said, next week is is Bollywood action Jackson, and next after that we've got a whole list of movies, and we've got oodles of ones in the can that you can go and enjoy too. So uh, uh, last week was The Bridge Too Far, and the week before, or no, last week was the Muppet movie, and the week before that was The Bridge Too Far, and so we cover the gamut. And our basic message is, if current day movies are leaving you somewhat less than thrilled, by yes. God, there's a whole library of good stuff out there that you can enjoy. Oh, so true. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, culture, let the folks know where they can find you and what you got going on. Believe it or not, I actually have my YouTube channel right there. It's me, Culture Casino. You can find me there, uh, Culture Casino on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, Minds, Getter. Twitter and other things. I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere. Culture Casino. And I someday will open up my Instagram finally. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, I've got videos coming out. I got uh, one, two, two. Well, I have the second one dropping here in an hour, although I'm trying not to squash my earlier um, 
my earlier video, which is just starting to pick up steam. If you haven't seen that one today, go check it out. And then I'll drop a third video either later tonight or very early tomorrow morning. Today was a very dismal Disney day. And but and the biggest problem is I have more dismal Disney stories to report on for tomorrow. I, it, 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 wow. I am I I I am I'm not, not at a loss. And I'm going to get into the video game stories tomorrow as well. Uh, I'm back into churn mode, so I'm just going to keep churning out the stuff. Boom, boom, boom. The boom, world boom. is a carousel of dismal. Uh, it, right now, yeah, it used to be car- color though. But uh, anyway, yeah. I love you all. Thanks for having me. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit a bit late, but I apologize. No apologize. worries, no worries. Glad you are hanging out with us. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Because we we got we got to have culture rant. It's not a show unless we have. <laughs> right? You got one. You got one. <laughs> I, I know that got clipped. I know that got clipped. Oh, you know what did? You know what did? Yeah. Well, <laughs> folks, of course, you know me, Rant Creole is my channel. I got stuff going on. I'm not nearly as. <laughs> As busy as culture putting out the uh, content, but and I've said it before, and I'll say it again: the best walk through the park and show you things you wish you were there to see. Yeah, on yeah, cool. the internet bar, and then oh. what's your next one? Where are you going next? Uh, next one, actually, I'm going to be going Friday, Friday morning. Since I don't have to work, we're going to do rope drop at the Magic Kingdom Ooh. and look for all kinds of Easter treats so we're gonna have fun um i'm gonna see if i can find the easter bunny i know he's hiding somewhere in the park so we're gonna we're gonna go and uh go and find the easter bunny just have a wait, good wait, wait. time you mean hmm? you mean disney's easter bunny everything has to be disney's whatever uh, right? yeah <laughs> disney's easter bunny we'll see what he uh <laughs> what he does. see if he tries to sell me a he dollar balloon <laughs> For you, folks, yeah, fifty dollar Cadbury egg. Only it's a Disney's Cadbury egg. Uh. <laughs> well, there is this uh, grand egg at the Grand Floridian that I was all excited to try because it had jelly beans in it, and I got it. And uh, the outside tasted like they dusted cr- crushed up Pepto Bismol on it. Oh, it, oh. oh. it was so disgusting. Disgusting having that on the outside. The chocolate itself, it was white chocolate. It was good, but I'm just like, this sucks. <laughs> that not, that's not a positive testimonial there. Right? No, yeah. I literally, I'm like, no, I want my $20 back because interestingly enough, the year before it looked exactly what it thought. It's like it had like fine castor sugar. It looked like one of those expensive, like, French chairs with like the tufts and the gold, you know, little gold. Oh, well, you just oh, yeah. your mic. Your mic just shut up. When you hit it, it went away. You're still gone. Oh, I guess oh, she's gone were... on her headphone too. She yeah, doesn't know that you. she can't hear us. That, that got it. Oh my god, I tapped the <laughs> microphone. Oh. I'm like going on and talking. But anyway, it's like <laughs> last year they had them out. The outside of the eggs, they had a crisscross pattern. So it was covered in like fine sander sugar. And in each like cross section, there was like a little solid gold, you know, like gold candy, little tiny ones. So Mm. it looked really gorgeous. And just, I'm like, ah, okay, I'm going to get that. So I got that this year. And I'm just like, I'm like, this is disgusting. Send it back. Oh my God. Send it back. That's the first thing I've ever had from the Grand Floridian. That was just gross. Uh, that's a shame. It's, yeah. 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 But the other stuff was good, though. We'll say that. We'll say that. Chocolate lollipops, bunnies, jelly beans are good. But yeah. So give me looking for that. And stuff. lollipops. And lollipops and roses. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I know that song. I know that Old song. song. Yeah. Well, that will be that will be me on uh, on Friday. So no no stream on Saturday, but on Friday, yes, Friday morning, we'll be out there. Rope drop, Magic Kingdom. We're going to see exactly how crazy freaking crowded it's going to be. So oh, it's man. crazy. Got to check that out. It's yeah, it, it's it's gonna it's gonna be insane. But uh, the extra thing, let's see. Tomorrow I will be on that park place because I actually have a chance to be on my schedule. So 
can't wait to do that tomorrow. I'll see you there and then. All right. It's going to be so fun. Cool. I love being able to come on that part place when I get a chance. And if you are a channel member tonight and I guess a little bit over, a little bit over an hour, hour and 15 minutes at 8.30, I'm going to be going through my PC parts list. I'm going to be unboxing all of my uh, parts. For my nice. new PC gaming PC builds, so we're going to be going through all the parts. I'm going to show you Ooh. guys all the parts and everything. We're going to do. We're going to do that. So come out and check it out. Fun. I'll be there, or I'll try and be there. But I'm I'll there. be there. <laughs> Dang I'll man, you are there. you are a one man disco tonight. I tell he you, he is. I love him when culture sing. <laughs> We need to get out of here. I need to. I need to get something. Yeah, yeah. Some I gotta idea. do that Me too. too. Do the do, too. the do the dinner thing. But folks, don't go anywhere because if you hang here in this stream, you're gonna get redirected over to Valiant Renegade, who is breaking down. Ooh. Disney getting its ass handed to him and uh, admitting defeat against Ooh. Florida. So, gotta go over there and check that out. So again, don't go anywhere. As the stream ends, it gets sent right on over there. So, love it as always, folks. Thank you so, so, so much for supporting the show, supporting the Spice Lounge. Appreciate the heck out of you guys. We'll see you next week. More Dismal Disney. Talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>